how to build a unicorn and why you should want to. And it's kind of very Silicon Valley uh, in this moment. Silicon Valley changes probably every three years quite dramatically. So this moment is not the same as it was three years ago or six years ago. It's very specific. And this talk is all about Silicon Valley right now. Um, and um, it takes about 20 minutes. If I do that, you'll get a sense of where I'm coming from and what I'm seeing. And then um, it should give you lots of questions and conversational stuff. And we can then just, just interact. Make sense? Great. You should be the boss. If I talk more than 20 minutes, tell me to speed up. It doesn't matter. He could be, but I'm choosing you because you're near the coffee machine and you're, you're taking leadership, even if you're not the leader. So, um, so what I did in Iceland is I, talk, I talked about these things. Firstly, how startup funding has changed. Secondly, what investors are looking for. Thirdly, how to think about startup ideas in this context. Fourthly, um, how to tell the story of your startup if you want to be successful. And finally, I give an example where for, I do a two minute pitch for one of my startups using this advice. Okay? Um, to, to show them a practical example. And this was to an audience of, this was the Minister of Technology of Iceland and the US Ambassador dignitaries, but the room was full of startup people and Iceland has 350,000 people, but about 30,000 of them are engaged in startups, um, which is kind of amazing uh, because the government gives grants. Uh, in the recent history, 24 million euros. If you do a startup, about 80% of all your costs can be given in grants by the government. So it gives you the bootstrapping. So, that, so there's a disproportionately high number of startups in Iceland. And some of them have been quite successful for a tiny country. It's amazing. Um, which proves you can be anywhere and do this. Um, so this is just a random selection of headlines from very, very recent publications talking about the phenomenon of a unicorn. And a unicorn is a word to describe a company which has a valuation uh, paid for by an investor of over a billion dollars. There's also decacorns, which are over $10 billion. And soon they're going to have to invent a new word for Uber because it's probably going to be $100 billion. Um, so there's this huge trend to very, very high value private companies that have yet to be profitable. And it's kind of unusual. There's another term called dragons. A dragon is less than a billion dollars, but the investment is sufficient for a venture capital firm to repay their entire fund when, when that company exits. Um, so it, it doesn't have a fixed amount. It's just enough to pay back the fund of the investor 100% back to the <coughs> investors. Um, so these are all the phrases, and it kind of sounds like pigs eating food at a trough. You know, there's basically this frenzy to be in a unicorn and there's a new phenomenon called unicorn hunting. So this is just evidence of the trend to prove I'm not making it up. Uh, this is a Wall Street Journal <coughs> graphic starting in February last year when there were 41 unicorns. Uh, and this is going through about 15 months showing how it grows. The ones in the, in the edge are $10 billion. And it gives you a sense of time and, and how rapidly it's more than doubled in 15 months. And the 10 billion ones, um, and that, what's that last one? 40 billion, I can't read it from here. Yeah. Um, it's probably Uber and one other company have just gotten there. And the trend is not slowing down at all. Um, so, given that context, how has startup funding changed? This is what we call the barbell. I've now made it weights because it gives a better... I couldn't find a way to create a, a lopsided barbell, so I created lopsided weights. But there's really three kinds of investing in Silicon Valley. There's seed investing, there's venture capital, and there's growth capital. Seed investing typically is um, companies... There's about 2,000 of these a year in the Valley, and it's typically companies that are raising money where the legal document is a loan. 
uh, from the investor to the company. It's called a convertible note. And that loan is uh, never to be repaid, although the document says it should be. Everyone understands it will, it will never be repaid. It will either convert into equity if the company is funded, or it will be lost if the company is not funded. So there's about $5 billion of available capital for seed investing in the Valley. Um, to give you a sense of it, um, a typical seed investment is under a million dollars, actually quite often under even $200,000. So if you go to one of the incubators like Y Combinator, uh, they'll give you $120,000. You'll spend three months there. You'll be expected to do a demo after three months to, to, to an audience of investors. And Y Combinator will own roughly 10% of your company for that $120,000 and access to those investors, which um, is great for Y Combinator and uh, uh, not so great for the companies, because uh, that's a lot of equity to give away for a very small amount of money. Um, and you know, the, the game that Y Combinator is playing is a numbers, <coughs> a numbers game. Uh, about 99 out of 100 of their companies die. Uh, about one out of 1,000 become a unicorn, uh, one out of 2,000 even. And uh, all they're really looking for is that unicorn. They're quite happy to lose their money on every other one. Uh, and that's, that's their game. It's, that's their game. It's like playing the casino tables where you're allowed to count the cards so you can have some kind of intelligence. Um, but it's still guesswork uh, to a large degree. Um, companies that come out of this successfully get into this stage and the most important thing to say about this stage is the total gross amount of money available is smaller than the seed money um, and that is because this is the risky stage this is when a company has not yet proven that it will work it, that's called traction it typically has only got very very marginal traction um, it's got a, probably a good team it's probably got some kind of a real world presence it probably has launched its product it's probably addressing a big market, but it's yet to be seen. And over the last 10 years, venture capital has shrunk from being the only thing that existed in the Valley. There was no seed capital 10 years ago uh, to being very hard to get. And uh, uh, you know, a typical A round investment is between two and $5 million. It can go, go higher, but typically two to five. And um, there's a very, very small number of funds that focus on that area. Most of them are sitting on the sidelines. It's like, you know, there's a horse race and you could bet on the winner five seconds before the end of the race. That's growth capital. Growth capital is when, you know, you wait, you see who dies, you see who survives, then you see who prospers. And at the earliest moment that you're convinced it's a success, you try and go and invest a lot of money tens of millions of dollars possibly uh, into the winners. And that is uh, not just, uh, a lot of people who used to be called venture capitalists, people like Kleiner Perkins, Axel, Benchmark, P Sequoia, names you've heard, now are more and more doing that and less and less either of these two. Um, and, and, and so it's um, very, very similar to the music business. If you think about a, a band, you know, you get a band together with your friends, you learn to play in the garage, you write some songs, you probably play in your local bars. If people like you, the word gets out, maybe you get to play in the big city next door in a bar there, and bit by bit you build up an audience, and then like magic, you get a hit single. Suddenly the record labels are all coming around you saying, let's make an album, let's put you go, go on tour. But if you don't make that hit single, you're gonna stay playing in the local bars. Uh, so, so it's a hit-driven business now. It used to be about innovation. Now it's about money chasing hits, which is dis dispiriting in many ways um, because that's not what I am here for. Most of us are here because we want to change the world. Uh, but, it, but now the capital that used to be there, when I first came to the Valley in 98, uh, my company was called Real Names. Real Names was uh, allowing uh, any language to become a web address. So like in German, you can't use umlauts in a URL. Well, with real names, you could use umlauts. And we created a, a naming system for the internet where a web page had a name and the name could be a keyword or several keywords with spaces. 
using any character set, Chinese, Japanese, Korean. When I first came to the valley, it was just an idea. I had a little prototype that worked, so to prove technically we could do it. And I raised, I think, $130 million for that company. About 50 million of that was raised before we were profitable. Uh, and 5 million before we'd even built the product. So we used to fund innovation here, ideas and teams. Now we, we really mainly fund success. And there's a very Darwinian ecosystem that lets things die young, very young. Um, and if they don't make it quickly, they don't get funding. Um, this is um, from The New Yorker two weeks ago, and it's worth reading. This is from Mark Andreessen, who was the founder of Netscape, and is now one of the big venture capitalists here. Each year, 3,000 startups approach A16Z, is the name of the firm, Andreessen Horowitz is the long name, with a warm intro from somebody the firm knows. A16Z invests in 15, and of those, at least 10 will die, fold, three or four will prosper, and one might uh, might saw to be worth more than a billion dollars, a unicorn in local parlance. With great luck, once a decade, that unicorn will become a Google or a Facebook and return the VC's money a thousand times over. There are 803 VC firms in the US and last year they spent $48 billion chasing that dream. But you know, Uber's worth more than that. So just one company. Uh, I think this is an animation. This is, uh, this is seed capital. This is the list of firms that invest in seed. And there's uh, more than 150 of them. Uh, they're called micro VCs. And they basically typically are investing between 50 and 100 million dollars over a five year period in chunks below a million. Um, they're all over the place. So if you have an idea, um, you flock to Silicon Valley and you start meeting these guys. Um, and, you know, it's, it's worth saying it's incredibly hard to get that seed money because out of the 2,000 that get it, there's probably 50,000 trying. Um, so, and, and usually they're one-man startups or two-man startups that are mainly engineers with no business partner at all, just messing around, hacking with code, building stuff, throwing it out there, seeing what works, seeing what doesn't. It's known as the lean startup movement, where you don't, you know, you don't need to be paid, so you can pretty much do it for free. And then if you get something that someone likes, they'll give you your first $200,000. These are the guys you go to. So there's 135 of those actually in Silicon Valley. This is out of date. I, did, I, I got this number about six months ago. I think it's more like 150 now. This is the other side. This is Sequoia's website. Uh, our growth team invests 10 to 100 million dollars to help companies scale up, build commanding market positions, and realize their highest ambitions. Um, so th this is where most of the money is, in this side. Um, in Geneva, Index Ventures, Danny Reimer, who's a friend of mine, just raised 706 million dollars for a growth fund. And Index is meant to be the startup guys in Europe. Well, not really. So, how do you, if you're a startup, how do you play? It's like a board game. And you know, 10 years ago you were playing Monopoly. Today you're playing Cluedo. It's a totally different game, different board. The rules have changed. You can't use what you learned at Monopoly to play Cluedo. You have to start all over again. So how does a startup play? So the first thing to say is, there's nothing irrational about unicorn hunting. It is actually rational. The reason it's rational is it does happen. And it happens because right now, two billion people on the planet have smartphones in their pocket all day, every day, and are an audience that you can get to as quickly as within 24 hours if you write some software that they want. And so the experimentation that goes along with the early stage seed ecosystem to try to find software that these people want is not irrational. Uh, the fact that it's highly Darwinian and most people die um, has to be balanced against the fact that some people succeed. And when they do succeed, it's hugely. 
And the main, the main difference between the failures and the successes is very thin. Uh, you know, I had a startup called Just Not Me that got half a million installs in about three months from 200 countries and then slowed down. And it looked great. Half a million is, by the way, a small number in the, in the context. It's got to probably be about 10 million to be, you know, on the radar of the unicorn hunters. <clears throat> but, um, you know, it, it's really, really hard to get to those numbers, but some people do. So therefore, it isn't irrational. It's quite rational. And the fact that it isn't losing money, but making money is kind of the proof of that at the, at the, at the generic level, at the, at the high level. <clears throat> this, is, um, this is Andreessen's advice from that same article to startups. Mediocre VCs want to see that your company has traction. Uh, Doshi was a founder of one of his companies. Doshi told me, the top VCs want you to show them that you can invent the future. So when I go and pitch, uh, I, I invest, but I also do startups. So I actually pitch these guys as well. Uh, as well as listening to pitches, I make pitches. And um, I'll explain why when, when I explain what, what I do. But, um, you know, the dominant experience of walking into a room is that the first question is, what is your traction? And the reason they ask that question is they want to know whether you might be a unicorn. And their only method of determining that is your current numbers, traction. Well, you know, most early stage startups don't have numbers that can prove that. So Andreessen is saying only mediocre VCs ask that question. It means they're not in any way intuitive, um, analytical about the world, uh, and are incapable of guessing what comes next unless the numbers already tell them it's there. Therefore, these are mediocre VCs. They're more like bankers than, than VCs. And, and he's quite right. Uh, and so when I walk into a room and the first question is, what is your traction? I already know I should leave. Because that guy, I don't want that guy on my board. He's going to be asking me dumb questions based on a spreadsheet for the next three years while I'm trying to change the world. <laughs> It isn't what I want to do. So I'm alienated, immediately alienated from that question. But most startups are not my age and don't have my level of experience, think they have to answer. So that's led to a phenomenon called growth hacking. If you've heard of growth hacking, growth hacking is faking traction. Uh, it's basically finding clever marketing devices, usually in social media, to get early success, which is non-sustainable, but shows numbers. Um, and then they say, look, these are our numbers. <laughs> and and uh, any half-decent VC will see right through that. But there's some really dumb ones that will give you money if you, if you grow back. <laughs> we see we have some growth hackers in the room. <laughs> so, uh, given that, how should you think about your ideas? Well, so I, I, I think there's actually something you can teach about this. Um, it's basically to do with uh, his, what I call historical thinking. Uh, how can you put, put yourself, without yet having traction, how can you put yourself into the class of companies that might be a unicorn? And, and you only have to be maybe a unicorn. Maybe is good enough. Uh, if, if, if you could never be a unicorn because you're doing too, something too small, uh, they won't listen. But if you could maybe be a unicorn, they will. And this is my methodology as to how to maybe be a unicorn. So the first is historical thinking. By the way, this is highly uh, Central European. It comes from Karl Marx and Hegel. It, and it's to do with understanding history. It's to, do, it's to do with knowing that the past and the future are separated by the present. And the present is a constant battle between what is dying and what is being born. And if you're, a, if you're an innovator, uh, you know, IQ test number one is are you building something that's being born or are you building something that's dying? Um, and, and so you really want to be operating, I think we press week, yeah. You want to be operating where that oval shape is, on the overlap between the present and the future. And you really want to be on the leading curve of that oval, as far into the future as you can get and the way you know whether you're there is people will think your idea is stupid. If, if people think your idea makes sense, 
it's probably too late. If you think it makes sense and other people think it's stupid, well, you've passed the first test because, because no one's going to copy you. Uh, you probably think you've seen a big opportunity uh, and other people just don't get it, which means nine out of 10 meetings you take, people will say, are you crazy? But there'll be that one or two people who will say, that's ingenious. So if you're not there, if you're not on that leading edge, if you're doing incremental change from the present that is valuable, that's fine, but it's not a VC fundable business. It's probably a business that can make money. It might be a great business. It maybe can make $100 million in revenue, but it won't probably be a unicorn, and they won't think it is. So if you want them to pay attention, you've got to be on that leading edge. And if you think about the life of a VC, you sit in a room for eight hours a day. You have a different person come in every hour. Mostly they're boring. You think there's no way on earth this person can ever make a unicorn. You're hoping and praying that someone will walk in that just blows you away. And they want, they'll blow you away with a combination of craziness and audacity. That, that's your dream meeting. Um, whereas most of us are trained to believe that when you go into a meeting, you've got to be prudent, show you know your numbers, show you're not going to lose money. No, that's, that's not what they're looking for. They'll, they'll make you the CFO of a company with that pitch. They won't give you $10 million to go and change the world. Um, so, you know, so where you position yourself is the first thing. And I said there's two things. In that curve, there's two things. The living dead, that is to say not dead, looks very much alive. Um, examples of this would be T-Mobile or, or, uh, or uh, let's say, um, Facebook. Uh, before it acquired WhatsApp and Instagram, or uh, Microsoft, or AOL for that matter. Um, very much alive, but not, doesn't represent the future. It represents the past, and the past has this way of hanging on and not dying, but it's not where you should be doing a startup. You shouldn't be trying to replicate anything they do. You should be only trying to accelerate their death. That's, that's the key thing to do. I started EasyNet in London in 1994. EasyNet actually is in Germany as well, uh, probably in Austria. It's in 29 European countries now. And um, it's definitely in Italy. Uh, and uh, it's um, a major internet service provider. But in 1994, it was me and David Rowe, my co-founder, in a, in a small corner store in London, off London's Tot Tottenham Court Road. Um, with uh, a server and 10 plastic modems um, uh, where people could dial in and get connected to the internet for 10 pounds a month. And um, British Telecom was our, you know, we were competing with British Telecom. Literally, we had no money. We spent 35,000 pounds on a credit card to set the whole thing up. We had no money. The first money we got was the first 10 pound check that came through the door on the first day we opened. We never raised venture capital because there was none in London in 1994. We grew from revenue, and in 15 months, we did an IPO on the AIM market. And within two, two years and a half, we were on the full London Stock Exchange, and then B Sky B bought us for like half a billion dollars. Um, and British Telecom was our enemy, and uh, they came to us, they were the only people we could get our backhaul bandwidth from, because no one else had bandwidth in 1994. So they came to us and said, and this is how dumb they were. This is why being, be, th people thinking you're stupid is really important. They said to us, we'll give you six years exclusive to home dial-up in the UK. And we'll put an 800 number where we'll answer it and sell your service for free if you will buy your bandwidth from us. So we, pay, we, we got a 64K frame relay line, which is like a dial-up speed, um, which cost us like 10,000 pounds a year. And they signed a contract giving us seven years exclusivity to home dial-up in 1994, which took you all the way through the bubble. Uh, so that contract was worth literally billions of pounds. They didn't know. They had no idea. They thought we were stupid. They thought the only thing that was going to happen is we'd pay them 10,000 pounds a month and uh, we'd die in some period of time and they'd get their revenue. Uh, two years later, they tried to negotiate out of the contract 
and they had to pay us millions of dollars to get out of the contract. <laughs> so people thinking you're dumb is good, because that means they're dumb. And you can leverage their dumbness for your own... <laughs> Uh, but they were the living dead, and they're still the living dead. They're huge, but they they still don't represent, you know, the real future. And then there's the unborn. The, the unborn are things that you know, uh, and some of your friends might know, but not generally visible yet. And there are just little signs of it, you know, in, in society. A great example of that right now would be Bluetooth Bluetooth beacons. They called eye beacons. These, I've got some there, I'll show you. They're, they're these little things that you can stick to a table. And all it does is go beep, 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 and gives off three numbers. And what it allows your phone to do is know within four inches where you are. Um, instead of GPS, which is like 60 feet of where you are, uh, uh, by putting a beacon, you, you can know within four inches. So in the context of, say, a restaurant, you can know which table you're sitting at. Um, or if you're in class, uh, in, in, in college, you can know which seat you're sitting in. Um, and uh, better still, your phone can be one of these beacons. It, uh, your phone can be turned into one in software, and you could associate your name with it, let's say, or your profile. You could then know who's in the room. So we, we now could say, uh, I could have all your profiles, whatever you'd allowed me to see, in my address book, just automatically because of beacons. No one really knows about beacons yet, but they create micro-location and they create time and place presence. They also, through associated metadata with them in the cloud, you can know about a place. So let's say you're at the, uh, the Bundestag. You can see the whole history of the Bundestag because it knows you're there, and the metadata is in the cloud. Um, so is it, called the, it used to be called the Reichstag, right? Whatever, the parliament. Um, anyway, so so... Uh, that gives rise to two things that no one talks about yet. The Internet of Places and the Internet of People. Right now, people exist centralized in Facebook or in LinkedIn. Well, now with smartphones and beacons, you can, people can exist in time and place. You don't need this big centralized thing anymore. And, and better still, you can have control over it, so your privacy is in your own hands. So the world's going to change again, but these things are not well known about. That's the unborn. Uh, and, um, you know, that's where the most interesting stuff happens. So, you know, rule number two, after making sure you are at the right point in history, is choose an idea that accelerates the death of these guys and the birth of these guys. Because then no one's going to say, um, you know, that's been done. And that's the worst thing. Seen it, done it, bye-bye. Uh, overcrowded spaces are a VC's worst nightmare. They don't know who to choose. They have no idea who will win. So then they wait until there's traction. But when the idea is one of these, they say, holy shit, no one's thought of that before. This could be huge. I need to get into this before it gets traction. It's, otherwise, it'll be too late. And then you can leapfrog this. I call it death by a thousand seed rounds. The typical startups today are not doing one seed round. They're doing between three and four seed rounds before they get fundable, if they ever do. Well, the way to, and, and then you give equity away, every single one of those. So by the time you get viable, you only own half your company. The way to avoid that is through this, through this approach. It, does, it, it doesn't always work, but it's the only way that can work. So how does storytelling play into this? So there's an easy way to explain storytelling, and it's, it's completely the opposite of what most people do. Most people, when you say, what are you doing, tell you what they've been doing recently. You know, how much new customers they got last week, or what new features they put in their app, or what they're building that they're going to launch soon. It's really all about now, when, when people tell stories. So I took the example of a book where... The equivalent would be to tell the publisher your, your first chapter and just leave it at that. And the publisher said, well, what is the book about? How does it end? And they, they would never publish it. So a book, you know, needs a beginning, an ending, and it needs a plot. And unless you have all three, don't go and see the publisher. 
So you have to do your thinking ahead of time if you're going to write a book. If you, imagine if you didn't do that, you'd end up with like 9,000 pages meandering to nowhere definite because you wouldn't know what you're writing. So, you, so companies are exactly the same, but with one difference. Instead of beginning and ending and plot, you reverse those two. You start with the ending. And that's how you can prove that this is a unicorn candidate. You start with, what will this be when it works? And that requires a spreadsheet. It's very simple. Uh, Netflix is a great example for this. Reed Hastings, the founder of Netflix, his um, only document that he had for his first funding was a spreadsheet. And the spreadsheet said, how many people are there in the world? And it, well, the answer was six billion. How does it break up into countries? He got a, the population of every country. How many of those households own a DVD player? Next line. How many of those households that have a DVD player rent DVDs as opposed to buying them? Next line. How many of those would rather not have late fees and would like to get the DVDs through the mail rather than having to go down the street to the store? Next line. And then he put a history into it, five-year five year projection. How will all these numbers change over five years? And um, he had uh, a price per month, and he could do a calculation that at scale, this was worth billions of dollars of revenue. And uh, it was completely logical. There was nothing in it you could look at and say, um, that doesn't make any, uh, you know, numerical sense. It made total numerical sense. So the only question now was, can you do it? Then he took them into a room, literally in his house, and he lives in Santa Cruz, into his room. There were two Mexican ladies in a small room with DVDs on shelves all around them, with a table in the middle, stuffing envelopes. And the guys thought, he's doing it. Now, imagine if he would have taken them into that room first before he showed them the spreadsheet. The guys would have thought, this is nothing. But he did it the other way around. And now they could put that little room into context and they could say, well, if he had 100 rooms like this, you know, he's going to do this. It's going to work. 